something is going on, and it's going on in different countries, and you can take a look at the dates and you can see. The uh, origin of philosophical counseling in Germany is Achenbach. In 81, he put out a shingle. He hadn't published anything, but he started a private practice. And from 81, then it went to Holland, to Wiening in 83. And Colin Clayton started his movement in 85 in England, and that's the conference we attended. And these other dates follow pretty much from that. Colin Clayton has been given the task, officially, of translating all of Achenbach's works, so he's the spokesman for that point of view. There is a great variety of different views in here, but we can break them up into categories. The most interesting distinctions, I think, that we can make gross distinctions. is how they relate to psychology and psychotherapy. There's a thinker whose name isn't here, Blass, B-L-A, A.S. Blass, who's coming out with a book that we were looking at when we were in England. And Blass is a psychotherapist with a whole roots back in Freudian analytical thought. And Blass's conviction is that the, the situation of psychotherapy is, now we're talking about psychotherapy, I want to be clear that formally, not eclectic systems. Eclectic systems are something else. Formal systems, by that of course I mean the great ones, Freud, Jung, Adler, Sullivan. Uh, because eclecticism brings up a whole new idea, and the idea is a lot of things may be working, but you can't attribute it to something because it's eclectic. In any case, Blast put, the, put forth the view that in psychotherapy, they're facing a crisis, and the crisis is that people don't reach fundamental levels in their own being, and therefore it doesn't go the way in which the, some of the major thinkers in psychotherapy would like to see it. And therefore, Blast and people like Blast want to see philosophical, a dimension of philosophical counseling on top of to meet the needs of what they see as an inadequacy in psychotherapy. Now when they talk about philosophical practice and counseling, what I mean by that is, formally again, people who can represent with some degree of authority the major thinkers in philosophy. Heidegger, Hegel, Nietzsche, Sartre, whatever they are. Formally, therefore, the major thinkers rather than systems, the major thinkers, people who therefore claim mastery of these major thinkers and in Western only, Western philosophy, have a view which they think is significant and they think it's significant in a therapy session to introduce those ideas because of the background of those thinkers can clarify certain issues which they don't think psychotherapists can do. Therefore, psychotherapists such as Blass think that the inadequacies of psychology and psychotherapy at critical times needs to be augmented by this philosophical practice. And with that, they think therefore they can meet the needs, especially if they're more uh, uh, perhaps uh, sensitive patients who want something beyond just adjustment, and that's the crisis. So that's our first group. Now, what makes a philosophical counselor is very significant, so let's make sure we get it early and keep it in mind. Through all of these, through all of these people, 
when they talk about philosophical counseling from the American Society for Philosophical Counseling and Practice, there is the movement that is urging that only philosophers with MAs and PhDs should be allowed to have the title of philosophical counselor. So they're already they're starting formalism, already they're starting uh, the next stage in the development, which then means they're going to try to preempt it legally and they use the term philosophical counseling as psychologists have done in the past to specify not what you do, but whether or not you can use the title. So that's where that is. So now, therefore, people who are philosophers with an MA or PhD who can express a certain thought of the major philosophical thinkers, mostly European thinkers, can then be called philosophical counselors. And it's this kind of philosophical counseling that Blas thinks is essential as an addition to bring up to date or make more full and complete psychotherapy as it exists today. That's the first school. Interesting school. At this point, there are a few people who are holding out to the idea that philosophical practice can be open to people without MAs and PhDs, and that's the internal struggle that's now taking place in this field, as it must always. Now, one of the next groups is a group of thinkers, and I'm going to use face-to-face that's the name of the organization, Face to Face, by Colin Clayton. He, I say, he started with basically a Heidegger. Heidegger is the root of the thought, trying to be present in the now and trying to express the needs of being integral in the moment and having an integrity in the moment and all the blocks and difficulties that keep people from being that kind of an integral person in the moment are the subjects that they then explore within the subject. Uh, <clears throat> We have to keep that door open. They told me that, that it locks, so <laughs> we may have that. Is it, yeah, could you? I think we may have to put something in front of it, but uh, let's hope that'll to keep it open. All right. So Colin Clayton. represents a Heideggerian point of view that he has turned around with his own creative thought and has applied this creative exploration of Heidegger in a practice working with drug, uh, habitual drug users, and chronic alcoholics. And he's being eminently successful with these two groups of people, which is totally amazing, the rate of 60% in his in-treatment facility in England. Now, <clears throat> Heidegger plays a major role as an existentialist, obviously, and so too does he influence Achenbach. They come out of the same philosophical school. Now, there's another movement that is trying to introduce philosophy, formal philosophy, on a simplified level to children. That's Matthew Lipman. And he says, as he makes a claim for the fact that introducing philosophy and rigorous thinking on the earliest level possible is therapeutic in itself. Now, this idea of therapeutic in itself is very interesting. That really, that really isn't what it says. Therapeutic usually means that some benefit has been stowed on the patient, that a therapy is a treatment, and therefore you expect someone to move from a condition that was previously uh, in some way less to a better position. So what they really mean, and uh, this is especially true of the American school and Achenbach in Germany, is that the kind of therapy, pardon, pardon me, I shouldn't use that term, the kind of counseling that they propose based upon using the major thought systems of European philosophers has and claims has no benefit. Claims no benefit to the subject. They make no claim whatsoever. 
but they think therefore that is nonetheless it's significant in itself without in any way being a treatment and therefore they don't see them in any way as a cure they don't see that what they're doing in any way is a treatment but they think that by just exposing the person in a crisis to a different kind of thinking than their own a thinking that they can represent with clarity that that in itself meeting another system is significant in itself since it shows them another meaningful alternative and perhaps challenging to the individual. So it brings the person to the crisis in the therapy. The person is therefore stuck. At that moment, they then turn the tables around and start giving them what is in effect, though they don't use the word, though I do, an indoctrination. Because it is a moment where someone is informing someone else about a subject matter which they don't know, introducing them into a formal system, and therefore it's a tutoring. It's a tutoring system. That's why they don't think it has any particular therapeutic benefit in itself. It's not going to deal with any of the classic symptoms that one encounters in psychotherapy. Therefore, it's a tutoring indoctrination system. And I think of the two terms, tutor and indoctrination, I think tutoring is a better term since indoctrination presupposes that you want to help the person believe what you think. Where actually it's to try to confront them with another intelligible system other than their own and deal with the consequences on that within each person. Um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting movement, therefore. It's taking it out of therapy. It's taking it out of the whole model of therapy. It's taking it outside of the medical model. That's the significance of this movement, as understood by Cohen and the Achenbach movement from Heidegger. So it's a rejection of the medical model. And in its place, a didactic model, teaching model. Now, um, since this has started, it is spreading all over, as you can see. It's now in Israel, it's in South Africa, it's in Australia, it's in Canada, strongly in Canada, in Vancouver, also in Toronto. Um, it's growing in Australia, the Institute of Soul Care, based upon the same premises I've just described. There's a split between these two people in Israel, Ron Levin and uh, Shmolin Schuster, and they have started their own society for the advancement of this thought. They've started their own, in, uh, and the um, interesting way to get into this is to get on internet and simply get in touch with philosophical counseling face to face. Go to Colin or any number of addresses I can give you later. Now, what happened? It really, in one way, the first in print, was Albert Ellis. Albert Ellis in America was the first person who really thought about the possibility of a rational, a rational treatment, a rational psychotherapy. He's the one who started it. And in 1964, Albert Ellis faced a crisis. And the crisis he faced was, his position was that therapy must be rational. Man is rational. Any difficulty they have is fundamentally a problem in the rational processes of thought that for some reason they're working off a premise and the premise they're working off of which they assume to be true is really something that's unexamined and therefore the whole problem of therapy should be to try to straighten out their thinking. He was holding this view in 1964. He met so much opposition to it at the Institute for Rational Therapy, which became his institute, that he changed it and introduced a new term, rational emotive psychotherapy. That was a compromise. It was a compromise that he didn't like at the time, and I think he still doesn't like it. But he started the game, and it was very interesting. His early work 
was of such a nature that he saw this as really the direction in which psychotherapy should proceed. And he thought what should happen is that man, we should get together, people should get together to explore dialogue. He said that's where the real drama is. We have to understand dialogue. And therefore, a therapist should become a master of dialogue. That was his early thought. He abandoned it. And uh, uh, that was a crisis. Had he stayed with it, then he would have been the founder of the system, and it would have gone in totally different ways. Now, um, there is another curious thinker here um, that started the uh, Epirion Society, Peter Mornstein, in the 80s in Canada. And he had an interest in Albert Ellis, and he continued it for a while. And uh, I don't know anything that he has in print. I should know it, but I don't know it. As a matter of fact, when I go back, I'll take, find out what happened to him. But he was closely associated for a short while with Albert Ellis. He started going back in that direction, and I don't know what happened to him. Uh, <clears throat> equally here is the Foundation for Critical Thinking that started in 1978 by Richard Paul. And therefore, there was a whole movement that the real problem for teaching and for learning and for people is learning how to think critically. And that's the real goal of education as well as psychotherapy. Richard Paul pulled the back away from the aspect of psychotherapy. And he remained, therefore, in the center for critical thinking. He saw that was uh, got him in too much of a uh, contest. Um, So that's what happened. Now, um, I should say that um, I published a work on the use of Platonic thought as a mode of psychotherapy in uh, 1961. That was uh, published at the Yale Journal, the Quarterly Journal of Studies of Alcoholism, and showed how a uh, philosophical approach based upon the dialogue and a kind of dialectic could be effective in understanding the dynamics of alcoholism. And I followed it up with another article in 1964 that was printed at the Rutgers University Press. When I left uh, San Francisco, went to New York to study, do some more work. I um, got in touch with Albert Ellis, who dropped me a note because he read my work. And uh, we had a nice talk. And therefore, this is the discussion I related to you, is the discussion I had with Albert Ellis in New York. Because originally, we were going to work together. But when I saw that he was uh, giving up the rational direction, I left him and let him do his own thing. So from <clears throat> 1964 on, um, I applied the principles of dialectic as a mode of psychotherapy. Mode means that it isn't psychotherapy, it is something like it. Um, when I was in New York, I decided to get another doctorate in psychology, which I went to the New School of Social Research for several years. And during that time, I was a uh, motivation researcher with uh, Albert Ellis's uh, Institute for Motivation Research and Motivation Dynamics in New York City for several years. And I saw that there was a real crisis in psychology then. And I thought it might be better for me to continue what I am, which is a philosopher, rather than change my perspective and try to become a psychotherapist. Because I was faced with the problem, the real curious problem, is that I saw the only place where you could really do dialogues might be in psychotherapy, where it's meaningful, where people are willing to consider what they think in a very serious, personal way. So I was attracted to that field. But I saw that the kind of thought I was involved in uh, at the uh, New School of Social Research in New York 
reached a certain crisis point, and I separated myself from them over a motivation study that was done at the, at, um, at, uh, the University of Minnesota. They have a great number of studies called the Symposium Studies of, from Minnesota, and there was one that we focused on, and uh, <clears throat> I parted on that study since everyone at the school was defending it as an excellent example of, of uh, motivation studies and uh, the application of technology at that time in the 1960s to uh, human behavior. <clears throat> what it was, I'd like to share with you, is that in this study there were a group of volunteer paratroopers that were wired in every possible way at the time so that therefore people could get a measure of whether or not their uh, levels of anxiety increased as they approached their first jump from a plane. And so the plane went up and they jumped, of course. Well, they were all wired and they had all this kind of data. And it was really remarkable because the data was very much, of course, they were involved with, at the time, with um, Dollard and Miller, if you're familiar with those two thinkers, they wrote a work. And the basic uh, point is that as uh, <clears throat> you approach a goal, right, you have to face certain levels of anxiety. And they thought that the approach gradient of any kind of human behavior has to therefore face the fact that levels of anxiety increase and at some point therefore they're going to cross. They're going to cross at some junction. Well, all of the uh, galvanic skin response measures and all the kinds of equipment that they had measuring these volunteers they found, therefore, that all of the scales for avoidance, to get away, fear, get away, occurred as they were stepping up into the plane. And I said, gentlemen, it's all over. I mean, you have the wrong model, because according to your measures, at that point, they should run away. They should flee. They should avoid. That's avoidance gradient, sword. And they said, no, 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 no. And I said, yes, 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 yes. And they said, well, take a look at all the scores when they jump out of the plane. I said, it doesn't make any difference. What all the, you know, there are all the kinds of factors may come in later. The point of the matter is the greatest scores occurred as they made the ascent into the plane. So I said, oh, this is ridiculous. They're trying to save their system. And I have enough trouble understanding philosophy that I don't have to get into a system that's trying to save itself, which is bogus arguments. So that's when I left. So, um, <clears throat> I thought, therefore, I was doing some motivation studies for Johnson & Johnson and Ford Motor Company and things of that nature. And I got fed up with that kind of application of the mind to that kind of, those kinds of studies. And I thought, best thing for me to do would be to find a place to do some philosophy and explore my own idea of philosophy and dialectic. So I said to myself, the first place that offers me a job, I'm going to camp there, and that's where I'm going to do my work. Well, I got a job in Southern California, if you're familiar with that area. <laughs> Um, in Costa Mesa at the uh, Orange Coast College. He gave me a job teaching philosophy. I said, fine. And that was in 66, 64. Was it 64? Yeah, 64. Well, I was doing uh, what I thought was exceptionally well until one of the faculty members came up and said, Pierre, we like you here, but the word is out. You're causing too much trouble. Uh, there's a new school opening up and no one knows you there. Maybe you should sneak over there and get a job. And I said, fine. So I moved to Golden West College. And I found out that that was the most ideal circumstance I could find. And I have absolute proof of this. And I think everyone will agree with you once you hear my argument. Ready? Here it is. Best job of all. It was a new college. They only had one philosopher. I was it. For 10 years, therefore, I could have my own courses, design my own courses. They gave me complete freedom in terms of what books to use, what books not to use. Therefore, I figured this was safe for a good number of years. It turned out for about 10 years. So I was exploring philosophy, and a group of people came around, students came around, and so we had a society, kind of informal society. And then the uh, school around uh, 68 came up and said, for a variety of reasons, wouldn't it be better if you didn't have your philosophy group on the campus? I said, fine. So we moved off the campus and formed an, another group called the Noetic Society, where we explored dialectic. That was formerly the group to uh, explore dialectic. Um, 
and wisdom traditions. That was our goal. Well, I was exploring this mode of psychotherapy, mode of, which is really applying Platonic dialectic to exploring human problems, improvising and using Plato and Plotinus. And it reached a point where the uh, people in this group said, look here, you have to teach us what you're doing. And a young lady at the time uh, urged me to do so. And I said, okay. So we incorporated the Noetic Society in order to legally protect the members exploring psycho this m particular mode of crazy mode of philosophical counseling at that time called uh, philosophical midwifery because of Plato's term philosophical midwifery. He saw himself, of course, as a, a midwife akin to his mother's, only she treated women who were pregnant, he treated men who were pregnant with ideas, but he said the same principles apply to both. So then, uh, the Noetic Society, therefore, was incorporated in uh, December of 1978. And uh, <clears throat> before this, I gave several talks about philosophy and, and uh, uh, psychotherapy and Buddhism. Uh, one was a one I, I just happened to be looking at the other day, uh, a major one I did in 1978. No, no, 1972. Um, Could be 71. Um, Alan Watts asked me to give, give a talk on the kind of psychotherapy that I was doing with Platonism and Madhyamaka Buddhism, and I said, fine. And so I gave a, a fun talk, a workshop at his houseboat in the SS Vallejo in Sausalito. And um, that was in 72. What was that word you just used before? Madhyamaka. Madhyamaka. Yeah, that's a school of Buddhism. Where it's that, the reason why that's so significant is that's the primary school that uses a dialectic, Madhyamaka Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can even spell it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Madhyamaka. Okay, Madhyamaka Buddhism. Look it up. It's a nice. There's a very important book by, uh, by Murti, M U R T I. And uh, if you're interested in looking it up, he did a very nice comparative study of dialectic, both Buddhism and in the West. Very fine scholar and a very uh, interesting, insightful Buddhist. So I recommend it too. Murti, I forget his first name. Okay. Um, then the crisis occurred. Uh, this young lady who urged me to start this philosophical midwife program in 78, at somewhere in the early 80s, she came up and said, uh, I think it was 84, she was a psychologist, and she said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to make a validation study of what you're doing. And I said, oh, validation study? And of course, I wanted to appear informed. So I said, yeah, 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 validation study. And she immediately, insightful, caught the fact that I didn't know what I, what, what, what uh, Strictly speaking, what a validation study was, it she informed me. She said, look, it's very important to make sure that if you say you are using a method that has particular stages in it and a development to it, that you can demonstrate that you're using that method and that there's a way of measuring what you're doing at each stage so that they can be correlated with any kind of psychological changes that are going on with the subject. So I said, gee, that sounds like a very good idea. So that as a result of that, a validation study was made of two subjects. Two subjects volunteered talks that I had with them uh, several years earlier. And the study was so designed that people were to volunteer their tapes. Two people volunteered their tapes. And as a result of the two tapes, we made a validation study, which was then given before the uh, um, International Meeting of the American Psychological Association in 1986. And that received a great reception. Uh, 
Most people were f infuriated at the very thought of philosophy entering into psychotherapy. And one fellow really had to be taken out. He got all upset. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I mean very upset. He, I literally had to be taken out. He got all red. He got, he got very emotionally involved with the very thought of going back to Plato, going back to philosophy. Um, during this time, uh, I also gave demonstrations up in state hospitals, uh, colleges, universities. And I should tell you one very noble and, and wonderful time I had at the uh, University of Santa Cruz, the philosophy department invited me to give a talk and a demonstration, and I did it. It was very successful. Uh, the person got all kinds of very interesting insights into the whole process. And when it was all over, the professor came up to me and said, um, very nice, but I don't think anybody, else, no one else, nobody else could possibly do that except you. Therefore, it has no validity. I said, oh, I'm familiar with validity. <laughs> At another meeting, two philosophers who saw this, professional philosophers, came up to me and said, this is in principle impossible. It's an oxymoron. You can't have a rational psychotherapy since man is irrational, and no rational process would ever help man since man is intrinsically irrational. And the basic motivation of man are irrational, therefore no philosophical tool or mechanism in any way of any kind could ever help man. I said, okay, it's in, in principle it's impossible. And that gave, that was the reason why he said there was no point in him going any further. Um, I then gave, uh, uh, had an opportunity with, by the way, the same, same young lady, psychologist, uh, where we gave a demonstration at a state hospital and it was videotaped what it was, they asked me to give a demonstration and a talk, so we arranged an opportunity to have one of the patients of the chief psychologist, one that they, one that this uh, chief psychologist had trouble with, he was going to then use that subject, and I was then to enter into a therapeutic relationship and explore their problems vis-a-vis -vis the dialectic, Platonic dialectic. And so I did, and we taped it, and I told them it would be interesting for me personally that we also have one at the end before I left in order to see what he saw, in order to help him later with whatever he merged in the first talk. Well, uh, I did it, had the talk, gave the tapes, and then we had a meeting with all the chief psychologists, psychiatrists there. And um, now this is a quote. One of the psychiatrists said, uh, there is, when I asked you know, whether they reviewed the tapes, they said, no, there was no need to view the tapes. I said, oh, oh, okay, there's no need to do the tapes. Um, actually, they invited me over here to the tapes, do the talks. What's going on? So I said, yeah, why? And he said, well, that's because you're naive. You don't realize that all of the patients here are psychopaths, and they're all liars. And therefore, all it is is they're trying to show one way or the other that they really are rational enough to get out of this hospital. And the only thing that you can really rely upon in this hospital is a physical means of intervention. And that includes electric rods and chemical chemistry, or et cetera. And therefore, even if it did work, in principle, you can't rely upon it because they're all liars. I said, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So you can see philosophical, uh, uh, this kind of philosophical midwifery that I have been exploring for many years has gained universal favor. <laughs> and so to add more, uh, I could add many more stories of a like kind, but the most interesting one is when we went, went to England to go to this international conference at the face-to-face -face center with uh, Colin Clayton. And Colin Clayton said uh, that he was interested in my demonstrating this particular art of philosophical midwifery, especially since I made the claim that this is effective not only for personal problems, but it's also important exploring dreams, the same methods, the same techniques, as well as during crises and problems that emerge in intense periods of meditation that some people engage in, like Zen students and people like that. And he said he had a problem with a dream for many years, and he would like to take this opportunity to challenge me to demonstrate that there's some method, one, that can be used, two, that it's rational, and three, that it follows the principles of philosophical midwifery, and I can do it right there. I said, fine, I did it. When I say I did it, I mean to say that I went for about three minutes and the American philosophers who were present 
One was so furious that he, act, he could not be contained, and he, he hollered and yelled. He said, we've had enough of Plato. This is impossible. I have nothing to do with it. Uh, dream work has nothing to do with philosophy, and, and this has nothing to do with philosophical counseling. You have to stop it. I refuse to be part of it. So it received a very nice, warm uh, reception there in England. And the other uh, American philosopher had similar comments, though he wasn't as emotionally involved as the first child. So you can see this is something that everyone can, once they hear it, they have an affinity with. <laughs> Why does it stop the talk, though? What happened with the... Uh, oh, no, no, I went on. No, no, I went on. It didn't stop me. What was his reaction? What was his... Which one? The, Colin? the person you, who raised oh, the challenge. Oh, yes, Colin Clayton. Yes. Uh, he said it was eminently successful as far as he was concerned. He got all kinds of insights, both into the dream and the way it applied in his everyday world, which was the standard I used for the exploring of the dream. That had no effect on the other people because they knew deep in their heart that there can't be anything meaningful in Platonic thought. The very mention of Plato was uh, enough to cause some of these people to go into an intense state of anxiety. You might say that the whole history of philosophy is nothing other than a battle against Plato. I mean, that's all it is. And Whitehead was quite right when he said that all philosophy is a footnote to Plato, but he forgot to, to add to that. Uh, and the uh, reaction to Plato is nothing other than hostility and, and uh, frustration and rage. And I think, that's a fair, I think that's a very fair statement. By my own experience, I can assure you that's true. Um, so, um, let me turn now. All right, enough of this. Let's do something more meaningful. What's the problem in philosophical counseling? I'd like to address that within a Platonic context. The problem that man faces is that he, one way or the other, can grow and develop, but to do so, it's very clear that he has to face fundamental problems. And there's no escaping it. Because we have been chained, as he says, from childhood. For it's as if we are living in a cave, in an underground cave. Now, the reason why we've been chained from childhood, not born with this, but chained since childhood, is that we are under the influence of a whole class of beliefs, and these beliefs have then uh, become for us believable, and when you have a state where you believe something to be true, you don't see it as a belief, you assume it's true, and you see through that truth as if it were truth itself. Therefore, the thing that you do have in the realm of belief is the image of the people that appeared so believable to you that you believe their belief they were teaching you. Is that a nice way to put it? Let's see if I can do it again, all right? For Plato, this is called the divided line. The divided line, therefore, takes on a pictorial form called the allegory of the cave in the upper world. All right. And let's draw it. All right. My art is really something that I often admire. Cave, open to the upper world. We are chained, fettered from birth, such that we have to look straight ahead at the wall of the cave and we're chained in such a way that we can't turn our heads one way or the other. Therefore, you can't see one another. All you can see are the shadows that are being reflected on the wall of the cave. There's a vast opening, therefore it allows some light to go through. But behind these prisoners is a raised platform. And on that platform, there are figures that move in back, back and forth with objects on their heads. And this wall, as it were, blocks them from any view. But behind them, up a ways, is a fire. And that fire, therefore, brings illumination. And these objects, therefore, bounce off the wall of the cave. And that's what these people take to be their reality. As if. 
Now, equally well, since they don't know anything else, they're also shadows of themselves on the wall of the cave, which they take to be themselves. These objects that these men carry on their heads are images of mankind. Man-made images. Man-made images. Man-made images. Where do those images come from in Plato? They come from our earliest teachers. They come from all of those people who influenced us in our youth. All the influences in our youth where anyone tried to persuade you and I of the truth of some belief, especially two kinds of belief, about the nature of the self and the nature of reality. The biggest of all teachers in the Platonic world is society itself. Society is the greatest sophist of them all. For in every way, in many ways, they try to show the, the student or the person, the individual, you and I, what to believe in and what to accept as real. And what it is is nothing other than these images, therefore, that are bouncing off the wall of the cave as shadows. Well, in order for these images to be believable, in order for the images to be believable, the teachings to be believable, the absolute essential thing is that the believers had to believe those <clears throat> influencing them were in fact knowers, really knew what they were talking about, were sincere, were sincere, and had their best interest at heart. That's the, big, that's the problem. You don't believe a belief because it's believable. You believe a belief because the person who instructed you is believable. That they made themselves believable. They made themselves so endearing and they appeared so strong and so magnificent at that moment when they're trying to inculcate these beliefs that to reject them would be to reject the fact that they're in that wonderful state of convincing you. At that moment, you know what? Every parent is what? Believable. They appear sincere. They appear knowing. To reject what they say would be, in fact, nothing other than to repudiate them in their moment of glory, because this is their highest moment of glory, when they're then trying to convince you about the truth of themselves, about the self, about society, and especially about the nature of reality. Uh-oh, nose is too long. So look here. Caught in this means, therefore, if you challenge the belief, you're challenging the very moment when this was inculcated. To separate yourself from beliefs, therefore, is to separate yourself from the very people who inculcated and brought about that belief and made it believable. And that's always a tension, because that means you have to stand alone, independent from what it appears to be, all your supporting methods that they then, in some sense, promise you, if you are, in fact, a believer. Therefore, in the Platonic world, the person has to see that what they believe to be true is only an image of this moment, they have to then begin to see, they have to reflect back on the origins of their belief, they have to discover under what conditions they were brought to believe it, and they have to recognize one way or the other that the teaching itself was always at, at variance with the nature of reality in yourself. You know why? <laughs> <laughs> Who can tell you the truth about the nature of reality? <laughs> Isn't that a guess? <laughs> Everybody, every parent wants to help their child. And therefore they want to prepare them for life. And therefore they want to confide in them the very things that were important to them. You know what? How many people have gained a real insight into the nature of the self and the nature of reality to be able to communicate that with all of the devotion 
and their sincerity and truth. Does it match what they themselves have discovered or have they done nothing other than give a belief that was taught to them? I once worked with an 11-year-old boy who had a problem. Parents were there. It was really interesting because the parents said, oh my gosh, I realized that's right. I really was trying to persuade my kid of the truth of this. I didn't know that's what I was doing. I was just trying to share. I said, well, where did you get it? He said, well, I, I, well, yeah, hey, that's right. That happened to me when I was, matter of fact, something very similar happened to me and my mother and, and uh, gee, I'll have to ask her. I said, well, where does she live? And he said, well, nearby. So a couple of weeks later, the son, the father, and the grandparent of the child came. And we had the opportunity to talk to the grandparent. The grandparent went through the same kind of analysis and said, oh my God, I didn't know that that was being believed the way it was. I didn't know it would have all those consequences on the person. I didn't know that would frame their perceptions about the nature of life and all their expectations. Good heavens. I said, well, where did you get it? And they said, well, it's very interesting that you asked that question because I remember. <laughs> <laughs> There's some beliefs I think go back to the cave. It's not a good and bad game. It's not a good and bad game. Very often they're trying to do something at that time, which is, as far as they're concerned, the highest vision. And the problem with life is that we don't have enough enlightened parents. That's all. I checked my own. And let me assure you, <laughs> as nice as they may be in many ways, they are not among those who have regarded as enlightened. <laughs> so look here, Platonic. What is the relationship between these two, therefore, becomes essential, or there is no freedom from it? You have to see in particular how the belief was brought about. You have to then test that belief. You have to then examine how they appeared. You have to then see that you were brought to believe what they believed. But what's most important in this whole game is that invariably, the moment a parent or authority chooses to do this, is when the child is then most open and receptive and therefore in a good state of mind. So what does that mean? See, if that moment is of the individual's clarity and openness and sincerity, and that's the moment when they brought this in, something very significant happens that's very strange. We all seem to make a judgment and the judgment is that what's being revealed to us at that moment is of the utmost importance and greater in its importance, greater in, in its most fundamental value than anything they, you and I, experienced in that openness. What does that do? You know what that does? That means any time we approach that openness, we're in a moment when we see that that state that they induced is being challenged. Because whatever is introduced is always not only at variance with the nature of reality and the nature of the self, but it's invariably opposed to our own highest goals. Because our highest goals always are to be, again, this free and open and receptive. And therefore, when we get close to this, often we'll give it up, dilute it, sacrifice it, and go back to the family belief, back to society's belief, back to the authority's belief. Because to reclaim that, to reclaim that means your development then continues. When it continues, however, in that openness, you're leaving people that you love, you're leaving people who you care about, and they won't understand what you're doing by no longer agreeing with their fundamental beliefs. It's a point, it's a poignant moment of, of, of confusion and suffering for many. That's why, that is why there's a need for philosophical counseling. That's why there's a need for people who've gone through this themselves and can help others only in one way help. You can't help a person go through it. <laughs> you can just share the fact that, hey, you want to talk about it? Want to get them to talk about it? Help them see the nature of the belief? Just reflect with them in their own experience. So they can then contrast it again and again. You know what dawns on them? Something new. A new way of understanding. 
a new way of understanding. Because that kind of understanding that emerges out of this is now that you're, just, you know, you're open to, to examination, you're open to analyzing, you're opening to looking at the roots of things. By going over a problem again and again, a person may have kind of a problem, by the way, that may express itself, even though it's one, it may have various modes, and they may all therefore be linked together, and you're not free of that one until they all go. But at times, you're able to achieve all kinds of things, even though a couple of these may still be in place. That is, if you have the dedication to achieve some goal for a short while, you can gain that kind of concentration and drive to go on and achieve. But you're then left with the same set of problems you had before, which is the ancient problem. That is to say, we can always be heroic for brief periods of time and gain very significant goals, but then we have to learn how to integrate it, and very often we don't, because we still have to face things we don't know we believe. Why is that? Because a belief that you assume is true, you see through. You see through. You assume it's true. Right? You assume it's true. You see through it. It seems obvious. To even put into words at times appears to be, re <laughs> to be the height of really ridiculous effort. I mean, someone might say to you, well, of course I don't feel good about myself. I mean, I'm not very good. <laughs> yeah. It seems so true to them, that's what they believe. Now, how do you call that a belief? That's not a belief. No, no, I can prove it to you. I've done it. Yeah, that's right, that's what you did. By the way, did you do it? Did, 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 because you have this belief? Oh, no, no, no. I have this belief because I did it. Did, 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 did. Therefore, a new kind of understanding emerges, and this is the goal of philosophy, this new kind of understanding. This new kind of understanding, therefore, is where you learn how to examine, you see, the assumptions, the assumptions, personal assumptions, personal hypotheses about life. This examining, critically, the basic primary assumptions, you can find in many fields, and Plato, of course, talks about the need to practice on formal systems, like looking at the premises of geometry and astronomy and music. But that's only a practice for turning it upon yourself. What does this do, this understanding, therefore? It then allows a fundamental development and emerging of a new kind of, just as this is a new kind of understanding, this allows a new kind of knowing to emerge. Now, this kind of knowing is, in essence, a dialectical knowing. Why dialectical? Because any assumptions you make about the nature of the self, any assumptions you make about the nature of the self and reality cannot match the richness of reality. Therefore, anything you say about it is inadequate. Anything you say about it isn't good enough. Whatever you do say about it, therefore, no matter how great and how noble, it's going to be less than it really is. To the degree that it's less than the way it really is, to that very degree, therefore, you're carrying around a belief that's going to obscure your judgment. Therefore, what is the way in which that kind of knowing can emerge through a dialectical encounter, development of a pure dialectic. That's very rare that this is ever approached in society. The whole Greek tradition that explored this thing called the dialectic ended at 529 AD, All right, when the Christian Emperor Justinian closed down the schools of philosophy and the philosophers, therefore, living in Athens then went into exile into Syria, and that ended formally any public exploration of philosophy, and this whole dialectical quest came to an end. It wasn't until Plato's works came back and Proclus's works came back that we have, en that we have any notion of this magnificent structure and exploration of using the mind to know itself. That didn't happen until the 16th century and the Greek text therefore entered Europe. It wasn't until 1800s, the 19th century, that the first 
Platonic text and Proclus text and Plotinus text and that whole richness of the Greek heritage came back to us. Therefore, we've only had it for 200 years. And some of the great works, especially Damascus, haven't even been translated, wherever that's going. So what's happening now is that there are more and more works since World War II of this tradition that are being translated than ever have been before. There's an awakening of this very deep and profound tradition. It is, in essence, a spiritual tradition. Reason and using the mind is itself a spiritual encounter. It's a spiritual tradition. It's a spiritual growth. That's man. Not through mortification of the flesh, not through prayer and fasting, not through breathing, but through using the mind. That's the Greek way. That's our spiritual roots. We were robbed from it way back then. We're now rediscovering it. And the people who are involved in that rediscovering are now moving into this realm which we're calling philosophical counseling. And it's a great thing to get into. I invite anybody who can to get into it as much as you can. It's uh, exciting, it's fascinating, and you can then challenge your knowing, your understanding, and your beliefs on many multiple levels. And most importantly now, this can stand and rival, and can rival other spiritual traditions. Rival, can compete with them. It did before. Philosophy was closed in Athens. Platonic philosophy was closed in Athens, not because it failed, but because it was successful. They couldn't convert the Platonic philosophers. They stood in opposition to this terrible development that went on in history. And now we're removing ourselves. We're emerging out of that. And we're now reestablishing ourselves back into a tradition that we lost. No other culture has had a genocidal act against its own spiritual roots except the West, until Karl Marx. Our part of our culture wants to deny this tradition, this Platonic tradition. They want to deny that it has this capability. It does have it. It had it in the past, and some people are interested in continuing it, and it's showing itself up now in a variety of ways, and one of the ways is through philosophical counseling. Therefore, there's a movement in philosophical counseling that's different from all of those, and that's called philosophical midwifery, and that's the kind that I explore and expound, and I have a lot of fun doing it. And now, how about some questions? Were you saying originally that uh, all, all the groups that uh, you mentioned on the board doing philosophical counseling are rejecting the therapeutic model? No. Or just no. See, so, um, Blas, remember, was the clinical psychologist who's using philosophical midwifery to augment. Philosophical counseling. That's right. Yes. Pardon me. Use it. That's right. Philosophical counseling. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. And so there, the yeah. And there's also a movement in psychology, especially in psychotherapy, that had its origin in 1986 called uh, GDRP. Uh, Grimes Dialectical Rational Psychotherapy. And um, this was an attempt by a psychotherapist, uh, a psychologist, to utilize my kind of dialectic in psychotherapy, very much like Blass is doing, only Blass hasn't done it as a method because there's no method to philosophical counseling yet. But this uh, um, <clears throat> psychologist uh, is the same one who d helped with that and started that motivation study, pardon me, that uh, validation study in 1986. So she coined the term Grimes Dialectical Rational Psychotherapy and uh, has practiced it various ways at times. Um, well, well, pardon me, Ms. Well, did, did you remember how to spell her name? Ms. Pardon? Do you know how to spell her name? <coughs> um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. How do you spell it? Uh, U L 
Uh, U-L-I. Ah, thank you. Do you have a first name? Uh, yeah, I think it's Regina. Regina, I see. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah, this is Regina Juliana who started the game and got these studies going. So I thought it would be only fair to introduce you to her. Fine person, does some very interesting work. And uh, she's paying for it at a state hospital. They're trying to uh, <clears throat> get rid of her for obvious reasons. Because you don't want to help people using their mind, because obviously that's very discouraging on the institution and its goals. But so where, does, where does the philosophical library and the philosophical counseling stand in respect to that issue? Because it seems uh, oh, that's a major good. issue. Good, good, so good. Of, good. Of yes. Philosophical midwifery claims, number one, that there are no academic qualifications, first of all. The only people to do it should be the people who can demonstrate they can do it. Two, all of the methods are known and are printed and available. There's even a uh, Macintosh program that outlines the entire exploration of all of the questions that's available. There's a workbook about it, and therefore there's no need to have any kind of accreditation because people should know what it is they're going to be involved in. They should they look at the literature, go through it themselves, and then they can tell whether the person they're dealing with is competent or not. As much as if you know something about auto mechanics, you can then pick a right, good auto mechanic. If you don't know anything about auto mechanics, then you have to trust someone else's judgment. Well, what model would you, I mean, the, the psychologists have the therapeutic model of therapy and diagnosis. Yeah. What, what model would you uh, place with philosophical midwifery? Uh, the validation study showed that there is no need for the DSM-3 because fundamentally a person only has one kind of problem and their problem is ignorance based upon a false belief. Therefore, while you can classify people according to psychological categories, they're not significant when you're talking about what to do in a therapy encounter or a philosophical encounter in philosophical midwifery. So it's really it, it, it seems to at least fit into the, the threat that the philosophical counseling movement is posing against the medical establishment in the sense that it's um, presenting the idea that the nature of man's problem is resolved through a, a means of education or insight. They would say... Not through a, a therapeutic that's right. practice. That's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Though they would, they would even be that, a little more cautious than that. You're suggesting it may be a benefit. <laughs> they, they don't even want to say it benefits the patient. No, no. I, that I understand your point. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, that, that's, a, I was, that's a strange position in itself to say. Well, that's the official position. And they charge for something that's not going to benefit the patient. Pardon? And they charge people for something that they say is of no benefit. <laughs> Well, when something is this popular, you can charge a great deal. The PC movement. Well, I, I really don't know to what degree they, they make them. You know, but I know that there are people who are doing this, and uh, they can afford to fly this country and that country and go to all kinds of conventions and spend all kinds of money in order to do it. They may have private fortunes, for all I know. But uh, in Holland, uh, there are institutes, uh, buildings, staff, people doing this, Germany and, and um, Israel, South Africa, now in Australia. So I presume it's, a, it's going to be a profession of some kind. I had a question. If a person comes in to one of these philosophical counselors who wants to then tutor, sees that tutoring them in some alternative view of reality, uh, existentialist or Hungarian mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, the person comes in in a crisis, right? He then reveals, he talks about the crisis, and then the person begins this tutoring process. And that, that, no? Yes or no. Okay. There is no formal way that has been agreed upon oh, as a model for the introduction of their particular tutoring. So he may come in a crisis and talk about it, he may come in a crisis and not talk about it until later or something. There's, in that sense, no steps. That's right. Okay. He may not come in a crisis, he may come in a... That's right. Or, okay, gotcha. Yeah. And when they intervene with their particular philosophy is up to the particular philosophical counselor. 
it is totally relativistic. By that I mean everyone has a right to explore a problem in terms of their own philosophy, the philosophy they identify with, and the way in which they see fit. It Whether it has any benefit or not is irrelevant. I think the way that you talked about it was that it's there would be something change, some, you know, I hate to use the word change, but something would occur as a result of their seeing an alternative view of reality, at, right? I would hope so. Something yes. would occur. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. so, and perhaps it would be that their death grip on the worldview that produces their crisis yes. is loosened, okay? Yes. Um, I guess my curiosity is, so that a person may walk out less convinced of the reality of the worldview they walked in with that brought about the crisis state, yes. but they wouldn't want to say that that was a benefit. You're correct. Okay. I just want to be sure I had all the pieces. Yes. Let me add to it. All right. Okay. At this point, there, this is a justification for the introduction of using Nietzsche, Hegel, Karl Marx, Heidegger, or any, in other words, it'd be perfectly interesting and uh, um, uh, get the best word for this. Um, I guess the only one I can use is indoctrination. Um, it's, it's giving, it is agreeing, if society agrees to it and allows this to go on, gives the right to a class of philosophers to, to indoctrinate people into their particular philosophy. It would be very successful, it would be very interesting during the Nazi era, uh, communist era, and uh, nihilism, I imagine, if someone was into Nyakyaya for uh, Bukharin, those people, they could also uh, express a need for the patient to understand nihilism, anarchism, and other things. Yeah, that's right. One of the similarities uh, that I saw in reading several of these philosophical mm -hmm. counselors' works is that they, they all, or some, I'll say at least, um, approach the problem that the person comes in with to the point, it's similar to the point where they like to get the person into what they call an empty state of mind. Mm -hmm. is, is that Well, ideally, ideally that's what they want. Because they, if you see, that's the same as the introduction of a pathologist or a problem or a belief. You wait until the person is open and receptive, and then you introduce the teacher. That's when the indoctrination can take place. That's when where, indoctrination whereas takes place. Whereas with your system of philosophical midwifery, that's, that's where the work begins. Mm -hmm. when, that's uh, the problem. That for them, that's the solution. For us, that's the problem. That's right. Quite right. Absolutely right. Yeah. There's a little bit of a flaw. There's a little bit of a flaw here. And uh, the reason I, I, I see the flaws in some of my own work is that uh, I've had some events and beliefs that I've you know, popped out of my queue and, and basically by doing it through therapy, when the images came out, they actually the images were approached by uh, uh, rational, uh, a rational approach. Mm -hmm. These images mm -hmm. pop out, mm -hmm. at least for me, some of the other people I still had images pop out. Most of these images had a, a tremendous amount of emotion and feeling associated with them, and also a lot of pain. Oh, definitely. And um, so to say that, so I, you know, I have a little bit of a problem with the idea that it's pure mind. Nice. If there's mind, and there's also the dealing with the, uh, the emotions and everything that comes up. Mm -hmm. Then once even you, 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 you're aware of those images, which are your mm -hmm. false beliefs, it's a whole other thing to take and then try and uh, you know, program your, uh, what is it, your brainware, your software up there. And it's just no easy deal to put a new program in there. Intense feelings are, are intimately connected with unknown and undisclosed beliefs. Which is why people often recognize that when you get someone, even yourself, angry enough, you might stumble upon the truth. And once you do it in anger, you're then released. Yes, feelings are intimately connected with the formation of beliefs. Remember, we're talking about beliefs of a special kind. And that is unspoken, unspoken, unarticulated beliefs our core beliefs, and around those are great feelings. 
because of a very important reason. You see, the inculcation of a belief in the early years, you sacrificed a better state for a worse. There's something, the most wonderful thing about the human mind, the most wonderful thing about being human is that the only reason you have a problem when you have a problem is because you want something better than what you're in. Right? Yeah, well, perhaps, but just to make sure. Uh, you see, I'm saying an unspoken belief. See, what's interesting is that from these scenes, they are always puzzles. There are always things that are puzzling. The individual walks away from it. They don't believe what is being said. Many, many of these early scenes, there might not even be anything said directly. It's something we infer, something we conclude about from those scenes. You can't blame it on them. So would you say no puzzles, no beliefs, pure state? Yes. 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 And since it's unarticulated, you have to allow the person to discover what it is they believe, which, which they never occurred to them that they believe. But it's interesting. It's something they themselves came to. Therefore, it's not a blame game. You can't blame it on them. You walked away with the conclusion. You carried the puzzle. You wondered about why they were doing what they're doing. It didn't make any sense for them to do what they did. You have to walk away and say, oh, wow. You have to justify it. It's that justification that's the problem. And there, no. The justification that causes the feelings, is that? Yes, this is, this is in essence, you see, in psychology, the problem is anxiety. In philosophical midwifery, it's anger. We are all angry. We're angry at the fact that we sacrificed so much of ourselves for something that was less. To get in touch with that feeling, to get in touch with that feeling is essential. But it isn't enough just to let it go as a cathartic experience. If catharsis was enough, the Catholic Church would have had the answer long ago with confessions. I mean, psychotherapy and psychology only emerge because of the inadequacy of the cathartic method. It's not enough just to release feelings. You have to get behind them and find out where those feelings came from and what motivated them. So and that's curious. Would the ideal state then be a state of absolutely no feelings? Oh no, these are, these are feelings that are tied and connected with something you don't know. This is ignorance, this is the nature of ignorance. This is ignorance. <clears throat> See, this is formally ignorance. When you have feelings about something you don't know, but you believe something is true that you can't articulate, this is ignorance. Without it, what do you got? Why, then you can believe what you want, feel what you want, as long as you know that you're believing it and feel that you're feeling it. Ain't no problem with feelings. And there are other ways yeah. to go. Yes, decidedly. And that you have the opportunity to make those judgments and presumably for the best reasons you can come up with and test them later. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think I anticipated where you're going. I shouldn't. Um, I, I'm not sure if the question you have was answered, and I'll tell you more. Because it seems as mm -hmm. if he was characterizing your system as purely intellectual and achieving its impact in its methodology through intellectual means only. And he was seeing to me that you were characterizing the other system as being mm -hmm. psychological mm -hmm. and as being uh, emotional in its using its methodology on feelings. And he was seeing it as a split. And, and although I heard you say that um, when you unpack, when yeah. you uncover certain deep beliefs, they have an emotional content. I wasn't sure if that answered the question. Yeah, let me see if I can do it another way, all right? <coughs> yeah, whether you did or not, we can continue. Yeah. I was asking him to resolve that dichotomy. Yeah, I don't think he's, I don't think there is one. That's why I thought that they should There is, but there is a There is, but there shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he's going to do It's that. rational, it's rational, because you are approaching it with a series of questions that have a formal integrity and interconnection. Formal. They all fit together. Right? It's dialectical because these formal questions
can be used again and again and again, regardless of the person. They're guided by a formal set of questions. And a formal set of questions that are exploring to a conclusion is a dialectic. It's rational because it all fits together within a rational system. That doesn't mean, however, they're not dealing with feelings. What it means is that you can explore a person's state of mind with their, all of their feelings to see whether they can come to grips with the feelings they have and what generated it. That's the, which, you will, which, by the way, you can do without ever asking them, in one sense, anything about... Yeah, if I was a psychologist and I was emotionally oriented, feeling right, oriented in that direction, I could probably come up there and do an argument and say, that, you, know, you know, fears and, and feelings are pretty primary, and if you really get to your... the really thing that's got you... if you really dig into those fears, you'll find the ideas behind those fears that, you know, that, that are causing everything. Yeah. We're, we're agreeing totally. Are we agreeing? Totally. Oh, okay. All right. Exactly. I, okay. I would. There's something I don't understand here. Then. No. Because I, the ideas are the beliefs. The ideas are the beliefs. When someone says, you know, uh, I think I'm beginning to see the problems I have and the belief structures I have, but uh, I don't know what it's going to be like without them. There's a certain security to them all. I'm familiar with them. I've been able to use them to my advantage. To give them all, I'm going to face some fundamental fear. Yeah, say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being alone. Huh? Join the human race. See, now that's a state of mind. It's a feeling. It's genuine. So feelings are ideas and ideas are feelings? But some feelings you can put words on and you know them and they're real. Not all. I'm not arguing in any way that feelings aren't real or important. Just when they're connected with things you don't know, and which have an impact on you and a consequence on you that, that is detrimental to your own good, then they become a problem. But not because they're feelings, because they're connected with something you don't know. So since you've worked with addiction since 61, and one of the current medical models of addiction is a huge physiological component, mm -hmm. how does your studies relate to that? Yeah. Well, just say, what is addiction? Addiction is that you've done something so often that you can do it with ease. And you know its consequences. And you know them very clearly. And you cannot deny what you know. I mean, if you know if you're going to drink and you only have a capacity for drinking up to a certain point and you pass out, that's something you know. You know, therefore, that when you drink, it's going to remove you from the realm of this kind of everyday world. And if that's your goal, then you know what you're doing. You're doing what you're doing. If someone then comes up and says, by the way, I have a perfect record. I know how to drink. I know what I do when I drink. I'd say, yeah, fine, of course. Well, go drink if that's what you want. But if you want to discover why you're hooked into a pattern and you can't get out of the pattern, that's a different dialogue. That's a different kind of exploration. Now we have to explore, now that you're doing something that you know at the moment when you're doing it, you shouldn't be doing it, that's the point of moment where we have to look at. Not later when he's drinking, and not later when he's recovering. When you know you shouldn't do something because of your experience and you do it, that's the moment for exploring. That's the key. It's like the yeah. Just yeah. When you're entering the airplane. Yeah, that's right. That's the moment. Yeah, that's the doorway into the, you know, into the mind. Does the uh, rectangular area there just for going up the spout, so to speak? Uh, the journey, the journey of the soul as if from hell to heaven, according to Plato. Yeah. That area there, the rectangle. Um, that's the open, receptive. Right. You, you mentioned that a person sometimes will forsake that to go back to what's known and that there's a, a certain kind of fear of, of going on into the unknown. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And how is that like, validated or is, is, this, uh, is this your experience in working with people or is this... Um, okay. The two parts to your question. Yeah. Should yeah, I let you finish first? You know, yeah, yeah. what's the, the basis for that? What's the mm -hmm. uh, yeah. background on that? Yeah, we're using the word the same state in two ways, right? First one, right? 
no one introduces this kind of belief unless someone can see the person is open and receptive to it. Therefore, in every problem, a person, when they want to explore why they're doing things that are unknown why they're doing them, uh, they then go, that they then, see, it's a way of talking. It looks like you're asking people to remember their past. It looks like you're saying, say, when did you experience that early? And you trace it back to such early events. That's not really true. That's just a way of talking. The reason why it's, it's, uh, it's only a way of talking is that people don't tell you about the past. People don't have a past when they have a problem. They, they, have, they don't have a past. What they have are all of those beliefs. And the more they begin to see that, they're, that they came to believe something which is not true, then they can recover their true, true, their true past. Then they can understand what went on. So it's a way of talking, just for a moment. All right. Therefore, when a person is in an open state like that, that's the moment when they then are introduced with this indoctrination problem. Sometimes I, I, it can be called the transmission. The transmission of an unknown belief. An unknown belief we have a special name for called the pathologos. Right, sick belief, sick idea. Right. When the child, therefore, is an open receptive state, that's a great moment to, for the transmission of the pathologos. The child is totally bewildered at why that's happening and why they're sharing something which appears to be obviously false, but they seem so uh, sincere, knowing, and beautiful at times and presenting it that way that the child then walks away and comes to a conclusion, unspoken conclusion. That's the pathologos. All right. Now, when a person then has to then reclaim that and discover what it is, what they're doing then is going back to this early state of openness and receptivity. In that state, a new kind of development is open to them. You see, they were stuck. They gave it up. And now when they're free and they can begin to see the forces that are molded, they're, they're, they're present and they can step away from it, now they can go forward. And that forward is in that open and free state. Right. And that's why there's mature growth and development out of problems. Now, where does the fear enter in? Well, uh, there's, of course, there are several kinds of fear. The kind of fear we were talking about a moment ago is that once a person begins to see the nature of their problem and how much they've, they've used it, two things, they're appalled by it. On the other hand, they also know that they've used it and they've gained all kinds of advantages from their problem. It allowed them to appear this way and that, and they found other people relate to it, and therefore their secondary benefits and gains are through problems. Therefore, they then have to see, they have to make a choice. People have to make a choice. The person has to make a choice whether they want to be free. And that moment of, at that, the, the, very, the very idea of making a choice, stepping, is to therefore remove yourself from all of those secondary advantages that accrue from accepting a problem. Like old fear. Oh my God, what will I do without the support of the family? What will I do without the secondary support of all my friends? What will I do if I drop my mask and then have to just look at people directly? What will I, okay. that's all this fear. And the second part of the question is, as you go up the neck, mm -hmm. and then the person starts to gain this understanding and knowing and mm -hmm. so forth, what is the machine or the mechanism that then frees them as, is, is it that a new, this new system is, uh, gives them more resources, is like um, another way to operate, uh, another way to be in the world that they then have chosen. So it's like, how does this work? How does, how does this, what's the motor, what's the machine that makes this work? when they go back into their lives. Yeah. Um, what I believe it is, to, 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 from my work, it is that the person ha has to be brought to see that they, it was their decision in these early days. They made the decision. They are responsible for maintaining that belief. Therefore, they are free to choose it 
or to drop it. And they always know that they can pick it up anytime they want if it's to their advantage. That is to say, it's sometimes in your life you may be in a terrible situation where maybe if you have to play stupid, it'll get you out of a, tra a tragedy. Well, if part of your game is to play stupid, you know it's so well adapted. You know, you do it consciously now instead of doing it at the mercy of someone else. That ability to choose, that ability to choose means now you're becoming more rational. It's your decision that's allowing you to make a decision. Now this gives you more confidence in that decision-making process. You're becoming, therefore, at that moment, rational. You can now explore the whole processes of reasoning and understanding, which wasn't open to you before. I think it's, a, it's an unspoken conclusion. Yeah, every time. Take that a little broader, does it mean that that's sort of like a, a, an unthought, non-rational conclusion? In the words, an irrational conclusion? Mm -hmm. So if it was an irrational mm -hmm. conclusion, it's a jump for me. Well, OK, I'm, I'm probing around in something that's irrational, mm -hmm. rational. It's a irrational. I think that's better. I think irrational is better. Because it is an irrational. That's right. Yeah, I'll accept that. It's a rational irrationality. Irrational. I like that, that, that suggestion. I don't know if you know the distinction. I know the distinction. Irrational. Rational is something that's not logical or rational. Because I know that some of the ones I mind out, and there's no way they're Mm -hmm. uh, mind things associated with it. Uh, so it would be a hard, maybe, maybe that's just my particular out peculiarity, but I would have a hard time believing that it was irrational. Irrational. But suppose the reason you believed it was irrational, the, the reason you accepted the irrational belief was for something that you didn't yet grasp. That's a possibility too. Yeah. And I mean that in all fairness because one of the problems that, that um, comes up is how do you know when you're free of belief? The nice thing about this is that's easy. Go back into the kinds of situations that you failed in or that you didn't do your most excellent and see whether or not you are now free to achieve those things which formerly you were blocked from or didn't achieve or didn't integrate or didn't maintain or didn't secure. Well, that, that's the QED on it because yeah. you have a yeah. belief about it. Yeah. That's what's nice about this, you see. It has its own principles of verification which are your own. You don't have to believe someone else that you're getting better. The needle may go this way or that way. Who cares? But it has, it has an assumption on it also. It has to function for it. It has an assumption that, that the, only, the open and receiving state is non-belief. Right? Well, yes, yes and no. Yes, it is. You, so you can be free of certain beliefs, but whether or not that means there are no, no other beliefs functioning that are unknown, you would then have to test. The most beautiful thing about this, you see, is that, and I'm glad you mentioned it because it's very important, um, little goals will get you a little insight. That'll give you great ones. This one will give you the greatest of all. The higher you go, the more you have to pay. Everything's a payment. The payment is you have to face what blocked you in the first place. Or to put it in another way, uh, if you accept another view, um, See, the fundamental problem is why are we so stupid if, we're wis if we are wise? I and mean, we're all wise enough to suffer. We're all, we'll put it in another way. Yeah, well, that, that's really true. Uh, if it can be said that in our own nature we are good, then the real problem is, then how come I act so stupidly? What's the nature of my own personal ignorance that's blocking me from functioning ideally? I mean, if the self is intrinsically good, if the self really shares in the very nature and the core of reality, if the nature of reality is one, and if the nature of reality has an in innermost integrity to it, then how come we're, we're doing what we're doing? That's the real problem. The problem of ignorance. That's why philosophy in the end is going to be the only real art. There's no place for psychotherapy in the end. So They'll end up being philosophers so for that reason. Or, or psychology has become philosophical, the same thing. So would you say the fellows who are seeing the shadows in the wall, I think in that play of dialogue, the fellows turn around, they see the images, and then they see the sun. <coughs> so then the, 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 the shadows are the images, and the images are the sun. Right? Oh, 
I see, but, but Plato says that, that. Where's my beautiful diagram? Here it is. He said, yes, what if someone were to come down in the cave and force one of these people to stand up and take a look at the, the shadows in the wall of the cave and take a look at what produced them and the light that produced the image? What would happen to them? He says, oh, they'd be terrified. It's terrible. They would want to return to the cave back to what they thought was to be real. It's much more comforting to endure that than to face the possibility that all of that is a fiction. And then it's only then to slow up, ascent up to the difficult uh, ascent into the nature of understanding and uh, knowing. Well, once yeah. you get to the level of understanding, then, then the shadows and the, shadow the walls are ideas. Yes, yes, a certain class of ideas, though. And then the a certain class of ideas, now. See, these are man-made images. These are the kinds of things that we have been persuaded of that are good and beautiful and true in the nature of reality aren't. Therefore, they're man-made images. When you get up into this realm, in the upper world, then you then have the same, uh, pardon me, you have a similar type of experience. Therefore, in the upper world, uh, you then, of course, have to get used to the brilliance of the upper world. But then you study these things because you can't study them in their own nature. So you study them in, in pools of water and reflections until you get accustomed to them. So you have to become accustomed to it. A different, and that's even puzzling. So there are levels of complexity and puzzlement. I mean, after all, what better problem can you have in this world than, you know, why are you here? What is existence right now? Why are you here? Right. What is this? What is it to be? Face that for a nice period of time and, and uh, see what interrupts it and what pulls you away from it. <laughs> 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 it's a workbook and a Mac program. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I didn't bring one, but uh, I can get it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question about your work on the Mac program. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there's workbook and a Mac program. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. To a societal level of beliefs. And it was about the people in Oklahoma City and the bombing. And basically the progression was is the bombing happened and we lost relatives and we felt so bad and then there were their funerals, etc. And then we found out that the government, the federal government, did throw their bomb. There was something going on. And we weren't told. The bomb squad in the area. So now they're very, very angry. So it somehow it seems to go along with what we have a belief. And now we're uh, we're very angry. Oh, you're quite right. Because what we believe. Um, yes, here are personal beliefs. Here are society beliefs, and how we've been manipulated in a variety of ways. Right in the realm of understanding. Yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, what did you say about society beliefs being an understanding? So that's why you have to then look at the assumptions and the hypotheses which underlie those uh, those very positions. Yeah. 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 Please. Uh, I think it was in December we talked about uh, Zen and meditation and mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the sense of contemplation and, and uh, direct knowing and that kind of thing. Um, that's another half. Um, perhaps. Uh, I'll tell you why I say perhaps. Um, I think it's extremely important to discover, if you can, anyone who's been into a meditative state and has achieved some degree of enlightenment or insight, to discover that what preceded it. If we could study with great detail what took place three minutes before, all the way up to the three seconds before the experience, right up to the last second of the experience, suppose we were to discover they then dropped through and saw some certain fictions and could drop them. It, it's another way of putting it, the old problem of uh, sometimes in order to get an insight, you have to feel good. You have to feel good about yourself, so you go to church, uh, so you do penance, so you do a variety of things to feel good enough to, in order to see. You know, same thing with loving. I mean, who wants to make love unless you feel good? If you feel good, you're also aroused. Aroused is feeling good. So in the same way, if you're having an insight, some significant insight, the, the likelihood from what I have explored 
is that the person was able at that moment, just before it, to drop some fiction about themselves, most fundamental. So therefore, they had to sit for long periods of time to get in the state where they could then endure their own insight into themselves. So what's fun is to play meditation games with Plato and speed it up. If that's one of the things that is productive to those insights, then any kind of process that would speed it up, that would be integral to it, would be the most effective tools for meditation. So the ideal thing in a meditation, you see, is to give someone a very clear goal and then watch the struggles they have reaching, especially if it's simple, such as holding on to a very significant question, meaningful question, such as what is the nature of the one? What is the ultimate good? Right now at this very moment, uh, what is it that's seeing, hearing? Uh, is the one and the good the same? Any one of these questions, if you stay with it, you'll get, you'll surface all of the problems of blocking. Because a belief is nothing other than a structure, a structure that you've sacrificed for in order to be accepted. So you no longer have to be accepted. So you turn on. It's freedom. But you can't anticipate it, <laughs> unfortunately. So, uh, if we're running out of time, if there are any more questions, because I'd like to introduce uh, Regina Liana, who uh, uh, was the person involved in these studies, and uh, Julie uh, Grable, who took the trip to England as well, and Julie Hoygaard, an extra psychologist, and Barbara also went. And uh, I'm sure you can ask them questions that will probably throw a whole different light on this whole movement. What do you think? Do you think we should do that? After you heard enough about it from me, haven't you? I, yeah, yeah, I have too. So, what do you think? Here's, here's a psychologist, it's been informative in this movement. She started this GGRP. And uh, it hasn't caused her any difficulty personally, of course, in being one of the founders of this movement. Um, what? I'm crossing all my legs and fingers when I say that. Hmm. How do you get paid? I mean, you have to put people, classify people, DSM-4 or whatever, and HMOs and insurance companies and everything else. Yeah, that's true. How do you get paid? Um, <laughs> I perform those activities. I, am, I, I follow those rules. But when I'm engaged in the therapeutic session, I practice this method. Mm -hmm. you know, She's using it in her practice. It so. doesn't mean that I can't diagnose a person. And in fact, this helps in diagnosis because you're quickly, much more quickly able to see the problems that are blocking their goals and what kinds of ways they defend themselves. So in that sense, it, 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 it really helps if you want to learn how to diagnose it. It will increase the skill. Again, asking you to continue to take my question, how about the number of sessions needed to I mean, HMO is talking about cures, so let's talk about just to be able to shut the people out of the system again. Uh, well, it depends on the person's goal. It depends on the severity. Uh, obviously, it's a, a variable. Um, if you give them the parameters of where, you know, I, I generally set them out and find out what their goals are, what their issues are. And um, ask them what their goals are, what they would like to achieve, and, um, in the, and in the process see whether they're going to be able to achieve it. That is by the way they react to how they respond to working on their goals. And that pretty well determines how long the sessions are going to be. If they're, if they're, if they're willing to work on their goals, and it's probably shorter if you see all that they're going to procrastinate, obviously they're not going to. Oh, I would add to that, that uh, 
Uh, people in this game have to state what their goal is. They have to be able to state they have a goal. It's always a specific goal that they are blocked and therefore there's a disturbance about pursuing it and achieving it. This is a method, therefore, that surfaces the blocks to the achievement of that specific goal. Therefore, it allows people to break through the obstacles to reach specific goals. That's the first level. Then, after they've done that for a few times, then they can take the general goal of wanting to rid themselves of all problems. That's two steps. First step is practical. And I think insurance companies would enjoy that. Do you give them homework to do? I mean, outside the session when you say go, sure. I you were talking about meditating on the major question. Um, yeah, uh, like, they can be as simple, uh, I work with some of the severe psychotic patients, they can be as simple as just every morning getting up and dressing themselves. I mean, it's, it's getting dressed. And what they go through in the process of yeah. following that kind of routine. Would it be possible to um, go through a case that you handled in chunk it down into yeah. some some steps mm -hmm. so we can see how yes. they yeah. how it, kind of the steps of uh, is there one that comes to mind that's maybe clear enough and simple enough that would, would kind of illustrate Pierre, the model? Do you think Pierre has that in, in many of the back he's done some like, really asking for no. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> I mean, what are we going to do with that? Where do you ask for a case that, you, that you're familiar with from your own practice? You don't want to pass it to me. Okay, but I mean... Uh -uh. Um, well, unfortunately, I, I, the kind of cases I work with, the patients are often transferred, so I don't get to sometimes get into the depths I'd like to. But let's take um, one where, um, I can remember what he used to say, he's a, he's a, he comes in and out of the hospital, he's a vault, he's, he, uh, he's got a high, um, he's a drug user, um, he's considered a bipolar, but, um, we spent the time just focusing on the, a one scene that he repeatedly brought up that related to what it, his state of mind when he took drugs. What was the propensity? He was in a good place. He was in an art uh, studio. He loved the work. That was his goal. He wanted to be uh, an artist and pers pursue architecture maybe in school. He, this job he had for two weeks and suddenly his brother comes walking through the door and his state was his brother says let's go out and get high well this you're asking a question what are the stages this took maybe two months to get this out of this person like there's a lot of blockage in these kinds of people sometimes that they can't even talk about a specific state of mind at any given time for any depth like they're jumping around but in this particular person, he was able to describe his place and time. And his statement was, um, well, I can always um, take this up later. I can always go back to this again. I can always do this again. Or I, basically, I can always get another job again. And as soon as I heard that, you know, as soon as that statement came out, I knew that was the key that would be important to follow. So that's the, that's where we, we just trace that everywhere, in, in, in every place he said that, in the hospital, um, any time he said that state, what happened to his goals. Oh, and Unfortunately, we didn't get much further yeah. than that. Oh. I mean, but that, that's the moment that we looked at because that took away his goal at that moment, that particular line. Was it important for him to see that? Oh, yes. And by the way, his report 
of that was that um, that got him to the next time he met his brother, it gave him the impetus to at least say no to his brother. He didn't stop. He didn't stop the action. He went ahead and took the drugs. But he verbalized for the first time to his brother a no, mm -hmm. which he never did before. So it's a big step for him. Now it would be interesting to find, since that's now said, what else is operating? And there will only be a finite number of things. And if you have enough time to be with that kind of a person, you can get them all down. Unfortunately, the hospital is causing difficulties for me to continue with such cases. Because it takes time and interest, interest, and you're going to become involved, and you want them to benefit by it. So you might even think that it's important for them to be there than somewhere else. And your supervisor, I presume, might have a different set of standards for why a patient should be where they are? Yeah, in fact, I have to now adapt it to groups, which has been a major challenge. How can I proceed in groups because they are moving away from individual sessions? And that's a real challenge because uh, their idea of groups is that you want to teach, mm -hmm. you want to train, you want to indoctrinate. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it, so I'm faced with that challenge right now. I don't know where it'll go. There's a, there's something in it that, that's used in prison. It's sort of called the game. It's sort of dialectic, and it's, it's actually it's a Texas Chainsaw Dialectic Massacre. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, what what happens is they'll just start it out by um, somebody will walk over and say, uh, "How come you're such a weird person?" And then a whole bunch of people will come over asking them why they're a weird person. So what they do is they're triggering them off, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of feedback. And then all of a sudden, somebody in the, in the group that's triggering off this individual will all of a sudden, he'll be really into it, or so then the whole crowd will turn on him. Mm -hmm. and it just goes around and around and around. And uh, I, I was in one of those groups once, and they, um, really, some people really got, you know, got themselves uh, back in some of those image states. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, mm -hmm. really, it's like, it's like maybe, therapy you know, one afternoon. So that's, that's why I say it's like a mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a nice term for it. Yeah. It's really about yeah. 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 I, I was involved in one of those, and I never saw any understanding developed out of it. I saw it as quite, quite what they call the term manipulative by the uh, people that were using the method. Mm -hmm. I. I I didn't see it as beneficial, except for the people who had a certain kind of power involved in the group. So I don't know. I don't know if it was the same, but um, the way you described it was quite similar to what I had mm -hmm. gone through. And there was no understanding. Okay. Thank you for coming.